Exercise 1. University's Calendar. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the International Language Center for the 2000-2001 academic year. We hope this year will be a year of success for you. Now, let me give you a quick rundown of our calendar for the first quarter. The orientation for new students will be held next Thursday, August 31st. September 4th will be our holiday, that is Labor Day, so there will be no school on that day. The first day of class will be on Tuesday. The following day will be exam day. Please remember that's November 10th and be prepared for the examination. I'd like to tell you that regular attendance at this school is necessary in all classes and lectures. We expect at least 90% attendance. Attendance is taken by each subject teacher. You know you cannot succeed in school if attendance is irregular. Absences of 20% or more will result in students being placed on probation for one quarter. Continued absences may result in the student being required to benefit from the course if you can agree on what is important to do and how you would like it to be done. The emphasis of this course is on observing how native speakers use English, describing how the language is used, discussing difficulties, and practicing the language as it is really used. Much of the material, particularly in the second part of each unit, may seem simple from a structural and vocabulary point of view, that is. The emphasis, however, is not on knowing nor even understanding such language, but on being able to use it yourself. This course is not for those who want to know something about English, but for those who wish to use it effectively as a means of spoken communication. The following assumptions are made throughout the course. 1. It is possible to study the spoken language, and this is in no way inferior to the written language. 2. Some students find grammar rules helpful, others do not but nobody finds rules helpful which are full of exceptions. 3. It helps to learn more words, but it often helps more to learn to use those you already know more effectively. 4. At your level, discussing the language and how it is used is an essential element in learning. 5. It helps to use authentic materials. This course is not for those who want to know, but for those who want to use the language. The most important objective of the course is to help you to be yourself in English. Exercise 3. Being involved in campus life. Good morning and welcome to our regular lecture on being a confident student. This series of lectures is organized by the Students' Union, and we want to help you to cope well with the life on campus. Today, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Ms. Diana Sheeran, who is the president of the Students' Union, and she has been kind enough to give up her time to come along and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. May I say it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I know, being away from home and having to look after yourselves can make you feel homesick and give you a hard time. So today, I'm going to talk about the ways of making sure that you get involved in campus life. This may help you cope better with your study and life on campus. To become more involved in campus life, 
Use your college's resources, which include places to go for help, people who can help you, and publications that can help you. Your instructors, academic advisors, counselors, department heads, resident advisors, coaches, and club sponsors are among the people you can ask for help. Become familiar with the services your college provides and know where to get them. The registrar's office answers all questions about records and grades. The Career Center can help assess your interests and skills. The Guidance Office offers help with course selection and scheduling and may offer personal counseling as well. Learning labs and libraries provide equipment and learning resources to help you improve your skills and meet course requirements. The Financial Aid Office handles questions about fee payment, scholarships, loans, grants, and jobs available on campus. If you need more instruction than you are getting in the classroom, your college may provide a tutor. Exercise 4. The First Year Undergraduates Two students are talking in the student's canteen. Is this seat taken? No. May I sit here? Please do. Are you a new student? Yes, I'm Marty from Korea. I got here only yesterday. I'm Alan, uh, second year in law. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Alan, could you tell me something about the first-year student's life here? Okay. You know, the first-year student's life can be exciting but terrifying for the first week. Why is it terrifying? Oh, many first-year students will feel very homesick for the first week since this is their first time away from home. By the way, do you live on campus? Yes, I live in a hall of residence. That's good. Living in a hall of residence soon helps you to make some new friends. You know, the university always provides accommodation to the first-year students. They may move out into a rented room in their second or third year, or share a house with friends. I see. That's reasonable for the first-year students so they don't worry about their accommodation and transportation problems. That's right. During the first week, all the clubs and societies will hold a student's fair, during which they try to persuade new students to join their society. Oh, I heard about that. I expected this kind of fair. I'd like to join some sports clubs so I will have something to do in my spare time. The first-year students are told that it is important for them to come into contact with many opinions and activities during their time at university. The first week, you may be taken to visit the campus. You can see groups of students walking around the huge campus finding their way around in the first week of university. And at weekends, the university may organize some trips to places nearby, so you will be quite busy for the first few weeks. It sounds good. All the activities will keep me busy. Thank you, Alan. You are welcome, and hope you will enjoy your stay here. Exercise 5. Be a successful student. Today, I'd like to talk about how to be a successful student. First, you should discover who you are and what you want to be. We all have our own personalities, qualities, character, and relationships. All those things together make us who we are. It's time to ask yourself, what kind of a person do you want to be? Shakespeare said, The world is a stage, and we all play different roles. Well, what roles do you play? A student or a teacher? Musician or doctor? Write your roles down. For each role, what are your responsibilities? Then ask yourself, 
What would you want to do? And what would your future look like? How do people get what they want? How can you make your dreams come true? One thing to do is to set a goal and make a plan to achieve your goals. We all know that good things don't happen overnight. But you have to be prepared. You might just have to work hard to make it happen. Remember, you need to make a plan for your goals. Write down your short term goals and break them into weekly goals so you know exactly what you need to do each week. You will be surprised how helpful this can be. Some projects are small and can be completed in a day. But then there are big projects like essays, reports, personal goals, difficult things that require planning, time, and effort. So you can plan personal and academic goals on the monthly and weekly planning pages of your list. Make it easy on yourself. Break down your projects or goals into small, easier steps and work towards them one step at a time. When you finish your plan, you should start to do it. Once you get going, it's much easier to continue. You can reward yourself with a treat. For example, some healthy snack or game for making progress on a project. You can work with a friend and encourage each other. You can design your own study schedule and stick to it. But be in control. Don't interrupt your study time for phone calls or TV shows. When you finish studying, you should review and check all completed tasks. Mark unfinished tasks with a future date and get ready to do it the next day. Now, let's just refresh our memories. First, to discover who you are and what you want to be. Then, plan to achieve your goals. And last, is to do it because you can. Exercise 6 Homestay Program. Excuse me. Could you tell me what the homestay program in the brochure is? The homestay program is designed to promote friendship and language learning. We try to provide the opportunity for cultural exchange between Canadians and international students who attend the university. Local people open their homes to students so that they may experience an exchange of friendship across cultures. Many friendships that last a lifetime have developed from these stays. I see. What kind of families do you choose for the hosts? All kinds of families participate in this homestay program. There are single people with or without children, as well as couples with or without children. Are they Canadians? Yes, of course. They are Canadians of many races and cultures. For example, they may be originally from Asian countries, so do not expect that your hosts will be Caucasian. But all hosts will speak English fluently, but some may have accents. Do the hosts know this program well? Yes. The homestay coordinator has visited each family and provides information on the program and explains the responsibilities of the host. They look for people who are kind and friendly and enjoy meeting students from other countries. They make sure the hosts understand that this program is not designed for their financial gain. It sounds good. If you are interested, you can apply for this program. Here is some more information to help you understand the program. What is it? You must be willing to communicate with the hosts to establish a good relationship with them. This communication will require honesty, patience, and effort. 
because cultural and language differences sometimes create misunderstandings and confusion. You must be willing to interact with the hosts. That's what I expect to do. Good. The hosts will be concerned about you and will want to do all they can to help you achieve success. They will encourage you to discuss your thoughts and feelings openly with the host family. If a problem arises that you cannot resolve in this way, the homestay coordinator is always available to help you. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to apply for the homestay program. That's good. You can go to the homestay office to fill in some forms. I hope your experience will be a positive one. Exercise 7 Koala. Good morning, everyone. In today's lecture, I want to look at one of Australia's famous and most loved animals, the koala. The koala is the Australian teddy bear and is the largest member of the phalangers family. The koala looks like a teddy bear. It is two and a half feet long, with ears seeming as if they were stuck on, beady eyes, and no tail. Its dense, woolly fur is blue-gray in color and was used commercially for fur until koalas were almost exterminated. They are pouched mammals, of course, not bears at all, but closely related to the phalangers. Koalas spend most of all their lives in the eucalyptus trees, feeding on their leaves. Their toes are armed with sharp claws, and their fingers are divided into two groups. The split in the hand, coming between the index and middle finger, instead of between thumb and fingers, as in our hand. The great toe is thumb-like. All of these features aid in climbing. Koalas, although usually slow and deliberate in movement, are able to spring from one upright branch to another with surprising skill. Their babies are carried in the pouch at first. Then it clings to the fur of the mother's back, riding piggyback until it is almost as large as the mother. Koalas become quite tame, and they are great attractions at the various Australian zoos and parks. Exercise 8. Stamp Collecting The collecting of postage stamps is a hobby that interests people of all ages and all walks of life. It has countless followers in every land. There are over two million stamp collectors in the United States and Canada, and among these are a great many boys and girls. The most valuable stamp in the world is the one-cent British Guiana Magenta of 1856. Only one copy is known to exist. It is valued at about $50,000. There are other stamps worth several thousand dollars while many others are valued at hundreds of dollars. Yet, most stamps are not expensive. There are hundreds of stamps worth a few dollars, and many more hundreds that you may buy for a few cents. So you see that stamp collecting is not merely a rich man's hobby. Each stamp collector finds his own stamps fascinating no matter how much or how little money he spends on them. The reason is that there is always a story behind postage stamps. The countries of the world use them as a means of telling the world about their industries, their culture, their great men. They also use stamps to celebrate important events in their history. So, while a stamp collector is enjoying his hobby, he is also storing up knowledge about all kinds of things from every corner of the globe. Usually, a beginner collects everything that comes his way. This is the best method, as in this way he will become acquainted with a wide variety of stamps. 
Later on, he may decide to specialize in certain kinds. But unless he has already collected all sorts of postage stamps, he will not have enough general information about his hobby to enjoy it to the full. Exercise 9. Get the right food to stay slim. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our regular program on health issues. Today I'm going to talk about ways of staying healthy and slim. You know, some people seem to eat to stay alive, while for others, eating is a hobby. Do you enjoy your food? Are you careful about what you eat? Or do you eat what you enjoy? Here is a very simple way to choose the foods that will keep you slim and in shape and feeling great. And you don't have to count calories. Let's divide the main types of foods into three groups according to their calorie concentration. First, we will use red for food that is high in calories. Secondly, we'll use yellow for food that is medium in calories. Then, we will use the green color for the food that is low in calories. Now, let's look at the red group. You will find sugar, chocolate, cakes, puddings, honey, jam, cream, butter, chips, peanuts, and soft drinks. Because these foods are high in calories, you should stop and think before you eat them. In fact, you should try to avoid them as much as possible. Moving on to the yellow group, you will find fatty meats, sausages, liver, eggs, milk, cheese, nuts, wine, beer, and salt. When you eat these kinds of food, you should be careful and not eat too much of them. Then we come to the last group, the green one. This group includes fresh fruit, salads, vegetables, seafood, yogurt, skimmed milk, bread, low-calorie soft drinks, tea, and water. When you eat these foods, you can go ahead and eat lots of them. You should use these three groups to discover a sensible balance that suits you. Remember, it is easier to stay slim than to lose weight once you have put it on. It has more parts and can do more types of work than any machine in the world. That is why we say that man is the supreme living thing in this world. Well, now let's have a look at our body systems. I'm going to go through them quickly, and then we will have a look at them in detail. Our bodies are made up of several parts. The head, neck, trunk, arms, and legs. These parts are held together by a framework called the skeleton. The skeleton is made up of bones, and it gives the body its shape and form. Bones not only support our bodies, but also help to protect important organs. The skull protects the brain. The ribs protect the lungs and heart. The hips protect part of the food canal. The spine protects the spinal cord. There are different types of bones in our bodies. The main support of the body is the backbone, or spine. It is made up of a long row of small bones joined to one another. It is found only in the neck and trunk. The bones of our body are hard, white, and strong. When a bone breaks, new cells begin to grow at the broken ends. More and more new cells are formed until finally the broken ends meet and join together. To find out if a bone is broken, 
the doctor uses an X-ray machine. This machine can photograph the inside of the body. The photographs it takes are called X-ray photographs. The ribs can be seen clearly from it. There are more than six hundred muscles in your body. They make up the flesh that lies between the skin and the skeleton. Muscles can contract and relax. Their contraction and relaxation cause body movements. They also push food through the body and make the blood circulate. Now let's see the nervous system. It is made up of three parts: the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. All parts of the body are connected to the brain by nerves. Nerves act like telegraph wires. They carry messages from the different parts of the body to the brain. Then the brain decides on what to do, and it sends messages back to the appropriate parts of the body. This system controls all muscle movement and also controls your senses. So the nervous system is very important. Because without it, we will not be able to feel, smell, taste, hear, and see. The brain is the most important part of the nervous system. It controls the movements of the body, and sends out instructions to all parts of the body. Exercise eleven: Inventor of the telephone. Today, people can talk to each other even if they are thousands of miles apart. They can hear each other as clearly as if they were in the same room. The man who made this possible was Alexander Graham Bell. His invention is the telephone. The telephone sends the human voice from one end of the world to the other. Bell is famous not only as an inventor. He is also well known as a writer of books to help people who cannot speak or hear. He was a teacher of such people. This made him interested in sound. This interest led to his invention. Alexander Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1847. As a boy, he was interested in inventions. He went to the universities of Edinburgh and London. His father and grandfather had both been teachers of deaf people. His father had worked out a system of visible speech, that is, a system by which a deaf person can see what people say by reading their lips. Bell learned this system. He soon became a teacher of the deaf. And he opened his own school for deaf people in Canada. Through his teaching, Bell became interested in the sound of the human voice. He thought that it should be possible to send sound across a distance. That is what the word telephone means: far sound. With his assistant Thomas A. Watson, he worked day and night on this idea. They strung wires across several rooms. Each time, when they thought that they had found a way, they tried to talk through the wires. Each time, they were disappointed. After each failure, they made some changes and tried again. Exercise twelve: Inventor of the telephone. Then one day in June of eighteen seventy-five. Watson, who was downstairs, heard Bell's voice from the attic. "Mr. Watson, please come here. I want you." Watson was so excited that he ran upstairs crying. "I heard you, Mr. Bell. I heard you clearly." On that day, the telephone had been invented. The words Bell spoke to Watson was the first telephone message ever sent.
Bell and Watson continued to work to improve the telephone. The first long-distance, two-way telephone conversation took place later that same year. It was between Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, a distance of two miles. In 1877, a telephone company was formed. The first telephone exchange was opened the next year in New Haven, Connecticut. It had eight lines and 21 telephones. From that time, telephone systems grew fast. Two years later, there were over 47,000 telephones in the United States. The telephone spread rapidly, both here and in Europe. Bell lived to see millions of telephones used all over the world. He had the joy of speaking from coast to coast by telephone. He died shortly before telephone service across the ocean was established. His invention brought him wealth and great honors. He was given many medals and honorary degrees. His invention has often been called one of America's greatest gifts to the world. When Alexander Graham Bell died on August 2, 1922, all the telephones in the United States were silent for one minute in memory of a great man. Cultural differences, individualism, and collectivism. The many cultures of the world differ in a great variety of ways. One of the most interesting ways in which cultures vary is in the extent to which they are individualistic or collectivistic. An individualist society and a collectivist society are different in many ways. In an individualistic culture, each person tends to think of himself or herself in terms of his or her own characteristics and preferences, the things that make the person unique or different from others. In a collectivistic culture, each person tends to think of himself or herself in terms of his or her social relationships and roles, the things that make the person a part of a larger group, such as an extended family or an ethnic group. Another difference between individualist and collectivist cultures involves the tendency to help others. In an individualist society, people feel some obligation to help persons who share some group identity, such as their distant relatives or persons from the same town. But this obligation is not nearly as strong as in collectivist cultures. On the other hand, people in collectivist cultures tend to feel very little inclination to help other people who do not belong to their groups, whereas people in individualist cultures are more often willing to help others even if they do not belong to the same group. Another difference between individualist and collectivist cultures involves the relationship between people and the groups to which they belong. In an individualist culture, people usually join or leave groups when it is in their personal interest to do so. In a collectivist culture, people usually stay with one group for a long time. For example, people in individualist societies are more willing to quit their job and take a new job at another company. People in collectivist societies usually prefer to stay with one company throughout their career. Similarly, people in individualist countries usually get married for reasons of personal choice and are more likely to get divorced. However, people in collectivist societies usually get married according to the wishes of their relatives and are less likely to get divorced. Western countries, such as those of Western Europe and North America, are usually considered to be very individualist. However, not all individualist countries are similar in every way. For example, the individualism of the United States is viewed as more competitive than that of socialist countries, such as Sweden. In contrast to Western countries, the countries of most parts of Asia and Africa are usually considered to be very collectivist. Collectivist countries also differ from each other in many ways. The idea of individualism versus collectivism is an interesting way to understand some of the differences between cultures. By learning about ideas like this, one can better appreciate the customs of other peoples. North American Indians. The first people who lived in North America were the Indians. The name Indians is actually not very accurate. Because the people are not from India, but when the first Europeans came to North America, they mistakenly believed that they had reached India, 
so they refer to the people as Indians. In different parts of North America, the Indians had very different cultures and very different ways of making a living. On the west coast of North America, many large rivers flow into the Pacific Ocean. In these rivers is an abundance of fish, such as salmon. The Indians in these areas obtained much of their food by fishing. They lived in settled villages and became experts in carving wood from the tall trees of the area. They carved large canoes for traveling on the rivers and oceans, and they also carved tall totem poles. Totem poles were carvings of various animal or human figures, and often the poles had a mythical or spiritual significance for the people who carved them. Many beautiful totem poles can be seen in cities such as Vancouver or Victoria, in the Canadian state of British Columbia, or Seattle in the American state of Washington. The Plains Indians lived in the central prairie of North America. The various nations of the plains lived by hunting large animals called buffalo or bison. Horses were brought to North America in the 16th century by the Spanish. The Indians who lived in the prairie areas had learned to become experts at riding horses, and on horseback they could hunt the giant herds of bison. They followed the buffalo from place to place. The Plains Indians lived in portable houses called teepees, which were made by sewing together buffalo skins and holding them in place with wooden poles. In the southwestern United States, some Indians lived by farming. In this dry area, the Indians raised several crops, such as corns, beans, and squash. Many of the Indians in these areas lived in large settlements where the houses were made from stone or dried mud. The people were experts at weaving, and they made clothing and blankets that had beautiful artistic designs. Near the eastern coast of North America, many Indians lived by a combination of farming and hunting. These people lived in fortified villages, some of which were inhabited for many years at a time. In some places, they built large earthworks that can still be seen today. In the forests of northern Canada, the Indians lived primarily by hunting, fishing, and gathering. Like the Indians of the prairie regions, they often moved from place to place in search of game animals to hunt. Today, the Indians of North America no longer live in their traditional ways. However, several Indian languages are still spoken by many thousands of people. Also, many Indians in the United States and Canada are very interested in maintaining the cultural traditions of their ancestors. Canadian universities. There are about 50 standing alone four-year degree granting universities in Canada. Unlike the higher education system in the United States, most of the universities in Canada are publicly funded institutions. Although there are a few private institutions, these public universities are funded and regulated by the province to which they belong. In British Columbia, there are four publicly funded universities: University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, University of Victoria, and University of Northern British Columbia, and one private university, Trinity Western University. In Alberta, the three publicly funded universities are University of Alberta, University of Calgary, and University of Lethbridge. In Saskatchewan, the two publicly funded universities are University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina. Moving into Manitoba, there are three publicly funded universities in the province. They are University of Manitoba, University of Winnipeg, and Brandon University. Ontario is not only the most populated province in Canada, but also has the largest number of universities. It has 17 publicly funded universities. They are, from west to east and south to north, University of Windsor, University of Western Ontario, University of Guelph, University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, McMaster University, Brock University, York University, University of Toronto. Ryerson University, Trent University, Queens University, University of Ottawa, Carleton University, Laurentian University, Nipissing University, and Lakehead University. 
The province of Quebec has seven publicly funded universities, with many of them having several branch campuses throughout the province. They are University of Montreal, University of Quebec, Laval University, Concordia University, McGill University, University of Sherbrooke, and Bishop's University. While French is the official language of instruction at most of these institutions, English is the official one at both Concordia University and McGill University. Canada's Atlantic provinces have the rest of the 50 universities in Canada. They are University of New Brunswick and University of Moncton in the province of New Brunswick, Acadia University, Dalhousie University, Mount Allison University, Mount Saint Vincent University, Saint Mary's University, and Nova Scotia Agricultural College in the province of Nova Scotia, University of Prince Edward Island in the province of Prince Edward Island, and University of Newfoundland in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. My name's Kalida. I'm a doctor in a busy hospital in London. My job is quite stressful because I work in the accident and emergency unit. Our hospital is the only one in the area with an A and E, so all the urgent cases come to us. Mostly, we see people who have been in car crashes or had an accident at home. When people arrive at the unit, I have to see them first. I examine them to find out what's wrong and make sure we give them the right treatment. When we're sure the patients aren't in any serious danger. The nurses put all the information in their personal records and find them a bed if they're staying in hospital, or arrange for them to go home if they don't need to stay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk in this series of employment lectures. I'm here this evening to tell you about my job. I'm going to tell you what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and what I hope to do in the future. Okay. Well, I'm a police officer. I've been in the police for just over five years, and part of my job is to give talks to students about police work. People often ask why I joined the police, so maybe I'll start there. I've always been interested in law and order, so I went to study law at university. But、uh, when I got there, I realised that I was more interested in the practical side of law than the theory. So I applied to work with the police force in my spare time. Then, as soon as I graduated, I was accepted for training. As you know, our job is to protect the public from criminals and defend the law. So obviously, the police force has to work every day of the week, day and night. This means we're often at work when everyone else is relaxing with friends and family, and we can't always be around for special occasions like birthdays and New Year's Eve. On top of that, we have a lot of extra work at weekends, especially when there's a football match and the fans are out celebrating. So our working hours are one disadvantage of police work. A lot of the time, we have to work with the public to avoid problems, and we get special training for that. But we can't always prevent trouble. So another disadvantage of the job is the danger. I mean, we know that some of the people we have to arrest will attack us. Now for the advantages. Well, one of the advantages is that police work is well paid. As I've said, it's a difficult job, and police officers work hard for their pay. But there are many more advantages. For example, sometimes the work's fun. Especially when we have to protect famous people from their own fans, I've met quite a lot of celebrities in my job, and I must say I enjoy seeing them close up and finding out what they're really like as people. But for me, the biggest advantage is the job satisfaction. Speaking for myself, I would say I get the most job satisfaction when I help someone, or solve a problem in a community, and in the future. I'd like to train to be a detective. I think I'd be good at that. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer, and I work for Campus Security. 
Welcome to this very short talk about emergency phone numbers. To start with, you need to know that emergency numbers aren't the same in every country. As we're in Britain at the moment, it's important to know that the emergency number is 999. So you'll need to remember this. Those of you who've been to the United States will know that the emergency number is 911, slightly different. But in Australia, the emergency number is completely different. It's 000. In Germany, the emergency number is the same as the rest of Europe. That's 112. And in case anyone's thinking of going on holiday to India this summer, it's useful to know that the emergency number there is 100. Good morning. I'm here today to give you a few tips about security on campus. We're not just here to prevent crime, but to make sure you're safe 24 hours a day. One of the services we provide for students who live on campus is to walk home with you if you need to cross the campus late at night. I mean, we all know the halls of residence are quite a long way from the library, don't we? So, for example, if you've been studying in the library till late and you're nervous about going home alone, all you have to do is ring campus security on 3333 and we'll send someone to make sure you're safe. OK? By the way, another important thing to remember is the campus emergency number. Uh, we all know the national emergency number in the UK is 999. But when you're on campus and there's an emergency, you should call 3333. If you call 3333, you'll get through to our own staff right here on campus. They can react quickly and get to you faster than national services. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. I like speaking to students, especially when there's a chance of making their lives a bit safer. Just to start, does anyone know what the most common crime is? No? Well, theft is the most common crime in the UK. There are various kinds of theft. For instance, robbery. When a thief takes something away from someone personally, like when you're walking in the street and someone grabs your handbag or your mobile and runs away, that's robbery. Another form of theft is burglary. When a thief breaks into your house and steals your property. OK, now I'd like to go on to talk about safety on holiday. You probably know that when you're on holiday abroad, you're in much more danger of being robbed. This is because you probably don't know the country very well. For example, you might not realise that you're in a dangerous area. One of the things you can do to protect yourself is to keep your passport and money in the safe in the hotel. You can always go back and get them if you need them. Another thing you can do is take an old mobile with you on holiday. These new smartphones are very popular with thieves all over the world. It's safer just to take an old one. When you start university, you'll probably find it's not all that easy to balance the time you spend on studying with the time you spend going out with your friends. In fact, one of the biggest problems you'll have is managing your time. Of course, it's perfectly understandable. I mean, in many cases, it's probably the first time you'll have lived away from home. So you'll have to do lots more things for yourself, like buying your own food, washing your clothes and managing your own money. At the same time, there's no one there to tell you what time to come home at night or what time to get up in the morning. On top of that, at university, you won't have as many hours of class as you did at school, and your tutors will expect you to study on your own a lot more. So you might feel you've got a lot of free time on your hands. So how do you deal with it? Well, to be honest, I don't think there's an easy answer. But I think it helps to go to all your classes, however tired you are. Print a copy of your timetable and put it on the wall in your bedroom. Actually, 
Your university might even have a system for alerting you on your mobile when your lectures are. Apart from that, you could try not going out during the week and keeping your social life for the weekend. I'm not sure that's very easy, though. One thing I will say, though, is that at the end of the year, after your exams, you can really relax. I started this new job a couple of weeks ago, and I'm having a lot of trouble with my work life balance. In my last job, we had fixed hours. We had to be at the office at nine on the dot, and we always finished at exactly five. Any work we hadn't finished, we could just leave for the next day. But this new job's very different. I mean, in this job, we can come into the office any time between eight and ten in the morning. Then we can choose whether to have a lunch break or not. Then it gets a bit complicated. Um,、uh, if we have a lunch break, we can leave between four and six. If we don't have a lunch break, we can go home between three and five. Okay. Well, at first this system sounded really good, especially for me because I have young children. But the problem is that if we haven't finished our work, we have to finish it off at home. So it's actually very difficult to draw the line between work and home. For example, on Mondays I can leave the children at school, go to the gym, and get into the office quite late. But I can't take a lunch break because I need to leave early to pick the children up from school. They come out at four. Then I have to work from home in the evening to finish what I have to do. If you look at this chart, you can see how we plan our projects. This one is a survey we're working on this year about where people like to shop. Okay. Well, we always start by having a team meeting. That's in the first column called tasks. So, in this team meeting, we decide what we need to do, who's going to do it, and、um, you know, like、uh, an outline of the questions we want to ask. Then we have to check the questionnaire to make sure the questions are right. If you look at the lines in column three, you can see the dates when we have to complete important tasks in the project. These are what we call milestones in the project. For example, when we've checked the questionnaire on the twenty-fifth of April, we'll have reached a milestone, and when we've completed the survey on the thirtieth of June, we'll have reached another milestone. On the fifteenth of August, when we finish entering the data on the database, we'll have finished the first phase of the project. The second phase of the project involves writing the report. We'll be doing that between the fifteenth of August and the fifteenth of September. And that's the deadline for the project to be handed to the client. In our company, we believe that our employees are more productive. You know, they work better if they're happy. Naturally, we have to make sure the company makes a profit, but at the same time, we need to think about the physical and mental health of our employees. We do understand that they aren't just working machines. So we have a policy of helping them find a fair balance between their work and their private lives, what we call a work-life balance. We do this in several ways. Firstly, we have a family-friendly policy, so parents can look after their children when they're very young. For example, sometimes they need to work flexible hours, you know, times that aren't fixed. Other times, parents have to work part time. And quite a lot work from home. Another example of our family-friendly policy is our generous maternity leave package. In our company, we allow women who've had a baby to take a whole year off work after the baby's born, and of course, while they're away, their jobs are protected. Because we want our employees to be happy, we carried out a survey recently. To find out which working patterns are really most popular, in general, our staff prefer to work at the office. In fact, nearly half come in during regular office hours. You know, from nine to five. Anyway, we also asked about part-time work, working from home, and another option. 
job sharing. Job sharing is a kind of part-time work where two people share the responsibilities for one full-time job. Anyway, we found that only five percent of our staff wanted to share a job, so it's not very popular on the whole. But when it comes to working part time, we were surprised to find that twenty seven percent of our employees would actually prefer it. That's a very high number, really, over a quarter of the staff. And then it was interesting to see that quite a lot of our staff, twenty percent in fact, would like to work from home. I'd like to give you an example of the kind of person who benefits most from our family-friendly policy. Sally is one of our assistants in accounting who has two small children. Sally's husband travels abroad a lot, so she has to look after the children on her own most of the time. Both the children go to a nursery early in the morning, so we've agreed that Sally can come in at eight o'clock after she leaves the children. At lunchtime, Sally's sister picks the children up from the nursery, but she has to go to work herself at three o'clock. So Sally leaves the office at two to collect the children from her sisters, and she makes up the extra time by finishing her work at home. I'm going to start this lecture by describing the structure of an offshore oil rig. Well, to be accurate. We should call it an oil platform. If you look at the diagram, you can see the top part of the platform floating on the surface of the water. The tall tower in the centre of the platform is called a derrick. That's D E R R I C K. The derrick is where the drilling machinery and lifting equipment is installed. Okay. Now, if you look about halfway down the diagram on the right. You can see a helicopter. It's parked on the helicopter pad. Helicopters are used mostly to transport employees to and from the platform when they have free time. Now, if you look underneath that, at the very bottom of the platform, you can see one of the four support towers. These support the rest of the platform. These metal structures are usually attached to the seabed by long cables. Right. Now the last part of the platform I'm going to describe is on the other side, just above the level of the water. It's a crane. That's spelt C R A N E. Cranes are used everywhere in construction, but this one is specialist equipment for lifting heavy spare parts at sea. In fact, apart from the derrick, you can see three cranes in the diagram. Some experts believe that if we knew how to control the power of the sea, we could generate enough electricity for the whole world. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on the UK and our capacity for generating electricity from wave and tidal energy. I'm going to look at how many megawatts we generated before 2008 and how many we expect to produce in 2014. So, if you'd like to look at the chart. You'll see that before 2008, our capacity was only one megawatt, but in 2008, when oil prices rose, there was an increased interest in marine power, and our capacity grew quite dramatically to four megawatts. Ah, now you might have expected this figure to rise consistently over the years, but in fact, it dropped again in 2009 to only two megawatts. This was because oil prices fell again, so there was less interest in developing alternative power sources. But nowadays, the cost of oil production is going up again, and there's been a renewed interest in marine power. As a consequence, capacity has increased steadily since 2009, reaching 18 megawatts in 2012. This trend is expected to continue in the near future. Reaching a total capacity of 50 megawatts in 2013 and 60 megawatts in 2014. Good evening. My talk this evening will cover three main themes. First, I'll outline a timeline of how deep sea exploration vessels developed. 
Secondly, I'll describe the most recent of these, the Deep Sea Challenger. And finally, I'll look at some of the benefits of this deep sea research. OK, to start with, let's look at how underwater exploration vehicles have developed over the years. The first manned deep sea exploration vessel was invented in the 1920s. It was called a bathysphere, better known as a diving bell. It was basically a round metal structure with windows with just enough room for two men to sit in. And it was lowered into the ocean on a cable. The first descent in the diving bell took place in 1930. And in 1934, it went down to a depth of nearly a thousand metres, which was impressive for the time. The problem with the diving bell was that it had no power of its own and there wasn't much room for the researchers to move around. So, the next development after the diving bell was the Bath Escape, a small manned submarine invented in the 1940s. The difference between the two was that the Bath Escape had its own power source, which allowed the scientists to investigate in the depths of the ocean more freely. A Bath Escape called the Trieste reached a record depth of 10,000 metres in 1960. Since then, a new record has been set by James Cameron, who descended to a depth of 11,000 metres for the first time in 2012. So let's move on now to look at the submarine that took James Cameron so far down into the ocean. If you look at the drawing of the Challenger, you can see the pilot's chamber at the very bottom of the submarine. It's a very small section, where the pilot sits and controls the sub and all the equipment on it. Now let's have a look at how the submarine is powered. Going up from the pilot's chamber, in the middle of the sub, on the right-hand side of the drawing, you can see a whole section covered in batteries. They provide the power source that takes the sub all the way to the bottom of the ocean and back up to the surface again. Next to that, there's another important part of the sub, um, you probably realise that there's no light at the bottom of the ocean, so the sub needs to take its own. If you look at the back of the sub, in the middle, just next to the batteries, you can see the panel of lights. They provide the light for filming and taking samples from the seabed. And one more part of the sub, which is important for navigation and to stop it spinning out of control, is the large fin at the back. You can see it at the back of the sub, at the top of the drawing. OK, to conclude my talk, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First, what is the purpose of this deep sea exploration? And second, is it worth the expense? I think one of the justifications for spending so much money on this kind of research is that it allows scientists to understand more about the surface of the Earth. For example, how it was formed and how it behaves. This could have important consequences for predicting earthquakes and saving lives through early warning systems. Another reason this type of research is considered valuable is that by exploring unknown parts of the ocean, we increase our knowledge of the availability of minerals for industry. And obviously, this could lead to huge commercial advantages. So, the answer is yes. In the long run, this kind of exploration can benefit both the ordinary population and industry. Exercise 7. Oxford. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of Oxford. Oxford has been a town for many centuries. The first written records of its existence date from before 912. Oxford University began to establish itself in the middle of the 12th century, and by 1300 there were already 1,500 students. At this time, Oxford was a wealthy town, but by the middle of the 14th century it was poorer because of a decline in trade and because of the terrible plague, which killed many people in England. Relations between the students and the townspeople were very unfriendly, and there was often fighting in the streets. On the 10th of February, 1355, 
a battle began which lasted two days. Sixty-two students were killed. The townspeople were punished for this. One of the punishments was that the university was given control of the town for nearly six hundred years. Nowadays, there are about twelve thousand students in Oxford, and the university and the town live happily side by side. The Oxford English Dictionary is well known to students of English everywhere. It contains approximately five million entries, and there are thirteen volumes, including a supplement. Some of the words are special Oxford words. For example, bulldog in Oxford is the name given to university policemen who wear bowler hats and sometimes patrol the streets at night. They are very fast runners. Punt is a word often used in both Oxford and Cambridge. It refers to a flat-bottomed boat with sloping ends, which is moved by pushing a long pole in the water. Exercise eight: Controlling concentration. Good morning, Susan. Come in. Good morning, Alan. What can I do for you? I've come for some advice. I'm a first-year student. I want to know how to control my concentration to study. That's a good question. I think you can improve your concentration by identifying and eliminating internal and external distractions. What's an internal distraction? Internal distractions are physical feelings. That you can take control of, since they originate within you. External distractions may be beyond your control, but you can learn to control your reactions to them. But how? To minimize internal and external distractions, you can take care of your physical needs before beginning a task. Maintain a positive attitude. Towards studying, and you can work to solve problems that you know cause you worry and stress. Yes, go on. You can improve your concentration by having a good place to study. The ideal home or dorm study environment is as distraction-free as you can make it. That's true. I can make it into a nice study place. You can choose a quiet location with adequate lighting. Select comfortable furniture suited to your needs. Keep your books and supplies readily available, so you don't have to interrupt your studying to find them. Prominently display motivational aids, such as a calendar, weekly and semester or quarter plans. Or assignments on which you have made good grades. I understand. I should find a nice and comfortable study place before I start to study. You are right. And how you study can also affect your concentration. Use your time efficiently. Break large tasks into smaller ones. Study similar subjects at different times. Take frequent breaks. Reward yourself for work accomplished. By the way, do you share your textbooks with other students? No, I have my own textbooks. That's good. Otherwise, you will be influenced by what another student thought if the book is underlined or highlighted by others. Thank you very much. I'll try the methods you have mentioned. Good luck. Okay. Bye. Exercise nine: Computing service. Excuse me. Could you tell me where the university computer lab is? Are you a new student? Yes, I'm a first-year student. I want to use a computer to type my assignment. I see. Our university provides the most up-to-date computing environment of any college or university. In Britain, there are two labs dedicated to student access. No classes are scheduled in them, 
so you can drop in any time when they are open. Do you know where these two labs are? Yes. One is in room 114 in building 315, and the other one is in room 110 in building 335. There are 27 computers in each one. Only 27 are in each one? Are there any other labs I can use if these two labs are full? Yes. We own six general-purpose labs, which often have classes booked in them, but they are available for drop-in use when classes are not in session. Check the lab before you go in. This schedule is updated every week. I saw the brochure in the Students' Union. It said that there are at least 19 labs on campus. Yes, there are 11 other large labs on campus, but they have dedicated uses of various kinds and are not usually available for general use. Do you know if there are any rules in the labs? Yes, we do have some rules. What are they? Let me think about them. Yes, the first, labs and computer equipment are provided only for registered students to do work associated with their courses. I see. So we have to use our ID card when we get into the lab. That's right. You should put your student ID card in the holder on top of the monitor and show proper identification if requested to do so. Second, computers are a limited resource shared among many students so please respect the needs of others. When all computers are in constant use, please limit your session on the computer to an hour at a time. Can we reserve computers? I'm sorry, you may not reserve computers. When you leave the lab for a coffee break, you must save your work and make the computer available for another student to use. I see. Can I bring some drinks there? Absolutely no food or drink in the labs. Are there any printers there? Yes, of course. But remember, when you print, please limit printing to one copy of a document. And please do not start printing less than 10 minutes before the lab closes. Thank you very much. This helps me a lot. Exercise 10, English Letter Writing. Hi, Lucy. Shall we go to swim after school? I'd like to, but I have to reply to my English teacher's letter. She has gone to America. You mean Susan? Yes. Why did she go back home? There are still some weeks left before the vacation. Her father died of cancer a week ago, and so she had to go back for her father's funeral. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. Lucy, do you have any time now? Yes, Tom. What can I do for you? I want to write a letter to my friend Bob. He went back to England yesterday and left his address for me, but I'm not sure how to write it. Okay. You know, English letter writing is different from Chinese writing. You should write your address in the top right-hand corner and write the date immediately below your address. Today is the 28th of March, 2002, so you should write the date below your address. That's really so different. We usually write the sender's address at the bottom of the letter, or write it on the left corner of the envelope. Yes, that's right. Remember, don't write your name before your address. Where shall I write my name? You should write it at the end of the letter. I see. Then, you should write the recipient's name and address on the left-hand side of the page. So, I should write Bob's name and his address on the left-hand side? Yes. That is the formal way when you write business letters or official letters. But you don't need to write Bob's name and his address in an informal letter. Okay. 
What else? You must use dear sir or dear madam only when you don't know the person's name. How do I begin when I write to Bob? You should use his name directly. In the custom of English letter writing, don't begin with dear friend. I see. After that, I can start my writing, is that right? Yes, you should begin the letter on the left hand side, a little way inside the margin. At the end of your letter, write a short final sentence on a separate line. What should I write for the last sentence? Usually, people write like this I'm looking forward to hearing from you soon, or I hope to hear from you soon. Then, end with Yours faithfully if you began with Dear Sir or Madam. In formal letters, if you begin with Dear Mr. X, you should end with Yours sincerely. I see. Don't use Dear Sir or Madam with Yours sincerely or Dear Mr. X with Yours faithfully. But what shall I use for Bob's letter? You can use yours, best wishes, or love in informal letters depending on how well you know the person. Thank you very much for the help. With pleasure. I have to go now. See you soon. Goodbye. Exercise 11 How to Become a Confident Student. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our regular lecture on college study issues. This series of lectures is organized by the International Students Office. We want to help you, the students of this university, to cope well with the study and social life here. This series of lectures is designed to help you discover the ways in which you learn most easily and most enjoyably and help you define your own goals and preferences as you embark on your college career and look ahead to life and work in the future. It includes discussions, illustrations, and easy-to-understand suggestions on ways to develop all the skills you will need to perform well in your classes and build confidence in your ability to learn. Some lectures will contain many ideas for strengthening a particular skill, but you can try out as many ideas as you like for studying. And also, you can adapt the ideas in the lectures to suit your own needs and personal learning style. Many students want to know how to be a confident student. It's a good question. Strategies for becoming a confident and successful student include making use of the four keys to success in college discussed in this lecture. 1. To assess your academic strengths and weaknesses. 2. To discover and use your learning style. 3. To sharpen your thinking and study skills. 4. To adapt to others' styles. Let's talk about the first one. To assess your academic strengths and weaknesses means to be realistic about what you are able to do. This will help you select courses in which you can succeed. This is the most important key when you enter college. The second key is to discover and use your learning style. This is another important key to your success. Use your five senses to help you take in information accurately and remember what you learn. Let your body's reactions tell you when you are most alert. Then try to plan your schedule accordingly. Know which learning environment you prefer, but be willing to adapt to others. Increase your level of motivation 
by developing an internal focus of control. A third key to your success in college is your effort to develop critical thinking and study skills. Making decisions, solving problems, using creativity, processing information, and reasoning logically are critical thinking skills involved in studying. All the important study skills you will need to develop or improve, such as how to take notes, listen effectively, read with greater comprehension, and prepare for and take tests, are covered in the next lectures. The fourth key is your willingness to adapt to your instructor's teaching styles. If you make an honest effort to learn, no matter how an instructor approaches a subject, then you will make efficient use of class time and develop good relations with your instructors. Exercise 12 About Language Learning Hi, Susan. How are you getting on with your English studies? It's hard. I have been in England for a year, but I still have a lot of problems both in speaking and reading. Don't worry. You have to be patient and practice them more. It's very strange. You know, my son Eric, he is only four, but he seems to learn English much more quickly than I do. Why is this? Why is it easy for young children to learn a language? That's a good question. I think part of the answer is that children have so many needs. They need to be helped by grown-ups. They have to make their needs known. And they are always watching the effect of what they say and trying new ways of getting what they want. Children are learning new things all the time. I agree with you. We adults need to learn new things as well, especially when we settle in a foreign country. But it takes us a longer time to get used to a new life than young children. They seem to adapt more quickly. Yes. Another part of the answer I'd like to point out is that children are not, as older people sometimes are, fixed in their ways of living. When they are taken from one country to another, they change easily from one language to another, from one bed to another, from one food to another. Older people are more fixed in their ways. They have been hearing and talking one language for a long time. Their ways of hearing and making sounds and of putting words together are like the rails a train goes on. They have been up and down their lines of talk and thought too many times to change them easily. I quite agree with you. A child is freer in his ways. He is more like a bird. He is free to go in any direction he wants. He is free to hear sounds as they are and make them as he hears them. He is free to put new words together in new ways in speaking a new language. I think that is why they learn things so fast. The more languages you hear and get to know, the more you will see how any language is made up of a small number of sounds put together in different ways. For example, in English, light and right are different words with only one sound in them different. The same is true of long and wrong. If a learner does not hear these different sounds as different, he may get the wrong meaning. That's true. I have had this kind of problem. Six months ago, I was asking the way to the station. The man told me to turn to the right, but what I thought he said was to turn at the light, so I tried to find the light. It took me hours to get to the station. I'm sorry to hear that. You know, most people learn their mother language without being able to give any account at all of how it works. They learn to talk as they learn to walk, without any idea of how they do it. People who learn to use a language well 
do so through talking with others who use it well, through reading good writers, and through watching the effects on others of what they say and how they say it. I will try all these. The world needs more people who can use languages well. Language is as necessary to our minds as the air we breathe is to our bodies. Exercise 13. How to take notes. Today's discussion is on note-taking. Note-taking is one of the important skills for classroom success. There is no one best way to take notes, but your own experience and some suggestions may help you to cope well with university study here. Chris, you start first. How do you take notes when you are in class? I always keep track of the notes by putting a date and heading on the first page and numbering pages that follow. And I often make sure to identify the lecture topic and the class in which the lecture takes place. I think this is very important because when you study later, you will be able to match up class notes and textbook notes or assignments on the same topic. I do the same. I often keep the notes for one class separated from the notes for other classes, so I use separate notebooks for each class. I use dividers to set aside different sections in one notebook. I think both of the methods are good. Some students like to use a loose-leaf binder so that lecture notes, textbook notes, and the instructor's handout may be taken out of it and reorganized for study purposes. That's a good idea to use a loose leaf binder. I will buy one for my note taking. I like to use a ballpoint pen for taking notes. So do I, but I prefer to use blue or black ones because the other colors, such as red or green, are hard on the eyes. It's a good idea to use a ballpoint pen because pencils fade easily and a pen sometimes blurs and soaks through the paper. My handwriting is poor, so I often print the notes for clarity after class. That's a very good way to do it. It's very important to make your notes clear to read because you may use them for your essay. I often use standard abbreviations in my notes in order to speed up note-taking. For example, intro for introduction. Info for information. Dept for department. This is one way to speed up your writing. You can also make up some of your own words or phrases that you use often. Make a key for your abbreviations so you won't forget what they mean. Okay, I will try next time. I often copy anything that is written on the board or on overhead transparencies into my notes because I find test questions often come from material that is presented in these ways. Really? I hadn't noticed that. I think you'd better organize your notes after class. Try to summarize the points in your own words. It will be easier for you to remember your notes. That is a good suggestion. Another suggestion is that you should review your notes to fill in gaps while the information is still fresh in your mind. The purpose of taking notes is to help you remember information. When I seem to be missing something, I often compare notes with my classmate or see the instructor. That's the way to do it. Thank you very much for your time. I think new students may use and adapt some of your good methods for note-taking into their own study. Exercise 14. The Dean's Speech Good morning, students. As many of you have already heard, tuition fees will be going up to $3,600 per term, starting in September 2001. I felt I should explain to you why the fees are increasing. The primary reason is, of course, that expenses have increased, including faculties and staff salaries. Our operating expenses have also increased in the past year. 
As we try to maintain a high level of service to our international students, we have added new staff in the last year to meet the growing needs, including a manager of admissions. We have also expanded our homestay staff to improve our homestay services. Unfortunately, when expenses increase, the costs have to be passed on to the student. This is the first increase in fees since 1998, however, and we are trying to keep the fees as reasonable as possible. To compare our fees with other institutions in the province, the University College of the Caribou is raising its fees to $3,800 per semester starting in September 2001. Programs at UBC start at $13,830 per year. At many institutions, the tuition fees for academic courses in the third and fourth year level are higher than those for the first two years are because the costs to run the courses are higher. We have decided not to differentiate the fees but to balance the costs by charging the same tuition for all four years. I would like to tell you that we value your opinion and want to make sure that you are satisfied as a student at the college. If any of you would like to meet with me to discuss the fees or any other matter, you are welcome to visit me in my office in Building 359. Please phone 741-2795 for an appointment. Exercise 15. How to write a summary. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about how to write a summary. I think if you remember one word, it will help you to write a summary. The word is simple. This word represents six steps to writing a good summary. Simple's first letter is S. S here stands for the first step you should do. That is, to study the text carefully. And letter I here stands for the second step, to identify the key points while you read the text. M here represents the third step of writing a summary that is, to make notes. Then the fourth one is to put points in order. The next step is to leave out unnecessary detail. The last step is to edit your first draft. Now I will talk about these steps one by one. Let us start with studying the text. When you get an article, you should read it first fairly quickly to get a sense of the general meaning. Then, read it more carefully, following the writer's argument and noticing what is fact and what is opinion, what is a general statement, and what is a particular example. It is often helpful to summarize each paragraph in a few words at this stage. Now, let's turn to identifying the key points. You must go through the text and mark the places where important information is given. You can underline or highlight with a colored pen or simply make a mark in the margin. The third step is to make notes. This is a very important stage. You should write down the key points you've identified in note form in your own words. This is also especially important in an exam because the examiner needs to know you understand what you have written and that you are not just copying from the text. Let's turn to the fourth step, to put points in order. You should look at the list of points you have made and see if there are any which go together. Then decide the best order to put the points in. Number the points in order. Now, let's look at the next stage. 
leave out unnecessary detail. This stage is much like the tailor who cuts off unnecessary parts for making clothes. You should choose the important facts and get rid of unnecessary detail. The last stage is to edit your first draft. You should check the spelling and grammar, counting the number of words. If you have many fewer than the limit, you should add in something, so it is important to check the original text again. If you have more than the limit, look for ways of combining points in one sentence or of losing words here and there. If you follow the word simple, it may help you to make a good summary in an academic essay. Section 1 Hello, Tourist Information Center. Mike speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I wanted to find out about cookery classes. I believe there are some one-day classes for tourists? Well, they're open to everyone, but tourists are always welcome. OK, let me give you some details of what's available. There are several classes. One very popular one is at the food studio. OK. They focus on seasonal products, and as well as teaching you how to cook them, they also show you how to choose them. Right, that sounds good. How big are the classes? I'm not sure exactly, but they'll be quite small. And could I get a private lesson there? I think so. Let me check. Yes, they do offer those. Though, in fact, most of the people who attend the classes find it's a nice way of getting to know one another. I suppose it must be, yes. And this company has a special deal for clients where they offer a discount of 20% a healthy food. And they have quite a lot of specialist staff. So, is that food for people on a diet and things like that? I don't know if I'd be interested in that. Well, I don't think they particularly focus on low-calorie diets or weight loss. It's more to do with recipes that look at specific needs, like including ingredients that will help build up your bones and make them stronger, that sort of thing. I see. Well, I might be interested. I'm not sure. Do they have a website I could check? Yes. Just key in the name of the school. It'll come up. And if you want to know more about them, every Thursday evening they have a lecture at the school. It's free, and you don't need to book or anything. Just turn up at 7.30. And that might give you an idea of whether you want to go to an actual class. OK, there's one more place you might be interested in. That's got a rather strange name. It's called the Aretza Centre. That's spelled A double R. E T S A. OK. They've got a very good reputation. They do a bit of meat and fish cookery, but they mostly specialise in vegetarian dishes. Right. That's certainly an area I'd like to learn more about. I've got lots of friends who don't eat meat. In fact, I think I might have seen that school today. Is it just by the market? That's right. So they don't have any problem getting their ingredients. They're right next door. And they also offer a special two-hour course in how to use a knife. They cover all the different skills, buying them, sharpening, chopping techniques. It gets booked up quickly, though, so you'd need to check it was available. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll go and check that out. That is... Section 2 Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well... We're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents, but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents 
and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list, and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference, but we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council. But, of course, it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end at the school road junction to regulate the flow of traffic along the high street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on school road just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the high street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Now, would it have... Section 3 We've got to choose a topic for our experiment, haven't we, Jack? Were you thinking of something to do with seeds? Mm, that's right. I thought we could look at seed germination, how a seed begins to grow. OK. Any particular reason? I know you're hoping to work in plant science eventually. Yeah, but practically everything we do is going to feed into that. No, there's an optional module on seed structure and function in the third year that I might do. So I thought it might be useful for that. If I choose that option, I don't have to do a dissertation module. Good idea. Hmm, well, I thought for this experiment, we could look at the relationship between seed size and the way the seeds are planted, so we could plant different sized seeds in different ways and see which grow best. OK. We'd need to allow time for the seeds to come up. That should be fine if we start now. A lot of the other possible experiments need quite a bit longer. So that'd make it a good one to choose. And I don't suppose it'd need much equipment. We're not doing chemical analysis or anything. Though that's not really an issue. We've got plenty of equipment in the laboratory. Yeah, we need to have a word with the tutor if we're going to go ahead with it, though. I'm sure our aim's OK, 
It's not very ambitious, but the assignment's only 10% of our final mark, isn't it? But we need to be sure we're the only ones doing it. Yeah, it's only 5%, actually. But it'd be a bit boring if everyone was doing it. Did you read that book on seed germination on our reading list? The one by Graves? Hmm. I looked through it for my last experiment, though it wasn't all that relevant there. It would be for this experiment, though. I found it quite hard to follow. Lots about the theory, which I hadn't expected. Yes, I'd been hoping for something more practical. It does include references to the recent findings on genetically modified seeds, though. Yes, that was interesting. I read an article about seed germination by Lee Hall. About seeds that lie in the ground for ages and only germinate after a fire. Hmm, that's the one. I knew a bit about it already, but not about this research. His analysis of figures comparing the times of the fires and the proportion of seeds that germinated was done in a lot of detail. Very impressive. Was that the article with the illustrations of early stages of plant development? They were very clear. I think those diagrams were in another article. Anyway, shall we have a look at the procedure for our experiment? We'll need to get going with it quite soon. Right. So the first thing we have to do is find our seeds. I think vegetable seeds would be best. And obviously they mustn't all be the same size. So how many sorts do we need? About four different ones? I think that would be enough. There'll be quite a large number of seeds for each one. Then for each seed, we need to find out how much it weighs and also measure its dimensions. And we need to keep a careful record of all that. That'll be quite time consuming. And we also need to decide how deep we're going to plant the seeds, right on the surface a few millimetres down or several centimetres. OK, so then we get planting. Do you think we can plant several seeds together in the same plant pot? No, I think we need a different one for each seed. Mm, right, and we'll need to label them. We can use different coloured labels. Then we wait for the seeds to germinate. I reckon that'll be about three weeks, depending on what the weather's like. Then we see if our plants have come up and write down how tall they've grown. Then all we have to do is look at our numbers and see if there's any relation between them. That's right. So then we get... Section 4 Hi. Today we're going to be looking at animals in urban environments, and I'm going to be telling you about some research on how they're affected by these environments. Now, in evolutionary terms, urban environments represent huge upheavals, the sorts of massive changes that usually happen over millions of years. And we used to think that only a few species could adapt to this new environment. One species which is well known as being highly adaptable is the crow, and there have been various studies about how they manage to learn new skills. Another successful species is the pigeon, because they're able to perch on ledges on the walls of city buildings, just like they once perched on cliffs by the sea. But, in fact, we're now finding that these early immigrants were just the start of a more general movement of animals into cities, and of adaptation by these animals to city life. And one thing that researchers are finding especially interesting is the speed with which they're doing this. We're not talking about gradual evolution here. These animals are changing fast. Let me tell you about some of the studies that have been carried out in this area. So, in the University of Minnesota, a biologist called Emily Snellrude and her colleagues looked at specimens of urbanized small mammals, such as mice and gophers, that had been collected in Minnesota and that are now kept in museums there. 
and she looked at specimens that had been collected over the last hundred years, which is a very short time in evolutionary terms. And she found that during that time, these small mammals had experienced a jump in brain size when compared to rural mammals. Now, we can't be sure this means they're more intelligent, but since the sizes of other parts of the body didn't change, it does suggest that something cognitive was going on. And Snellrude thinks that this change might reflect the cognitive demands of adjusting to city life, having to look in different places to find food, for example, and coping with a whole new set of dangers. Then over in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute, there's another biologist called Katerina Miranda, who's done some experiments with blackbirds living in urban and rural areas. And she's been looking not at their anatomy, but at their behavior. So, as you might expect, she's found that the urban blackbirds tend to be quite bold. They're prepared to face up to a lot of threats that would frighten away their country counterparts. But there's one type of situation that does seem to frighten the urban blackbirds, and that's anything new, anything they haven't experienced before. And if you think about it, that's quite sensible for a bird living in the city. Jonathan Atwell, in Indiana University, is looking at how a range of animals respond to urban environments. He's found that when they're under stress, their endocrine systems react by reducing the amount of hormones such as corticosterone into their blood. It's a sensible-seeming adaptation. A rat that gets scared every time a subway train rolls past won't be very successful. There's just one more study I'd like to mention, which is by Sarah Parton and her team. And they've been looking at how squirrels communicate in an urban environment, and they've found that a routine part of their communication is carried out by waving their tails. You do also see this in the country, but it's much more prevalent in cities, possibly because it's effective in a noisy environment. So, what are the long-term implications of this? One possibility is that we may see completely new species developing in cities. But on the other hand, it's possible that not all of these adaptations will be permanent. Once the animals got accustomed to its new environment, it may no longer need the features it's developed. So now we've had a look at adaptation. Section 1 Hello, South City Cycling Club. Oh, hi. Um, I want to find out about joining the club. Right, I can help you there. I'm the club secretary and my name's Jim Hunter. Oh, hi, Jim. So, are you interested in membership for yourself? That's right. OK, well, there are basically two types of adult membership. If you're pretty serious about cycling, there's the full membership. That costs $260 and that covers you not just for ordinary cycling, but also for races, both here in the city and also in other parts of Australia. Right. Well, I'm not really up to that standard. I was more interested in just joining a group to do some cycling in my free time. Sure. That's why most people join. So, in that case, you'd be better with the recreational membership. That's $108 if you're over 19 and $95 if you're under. I'm 25. OK. It's paid quarterly, and you can upgrade it later to the full membership if you want to, of course. Now, both types of membership include the club fee of $20. They also provide insurance in case you have an accident, though we hope you won't need that, of course. No. OK. Well, I'll go with the recreational membership, I think. And that allows me to join in the club activities and so on? That's right. And once you're a member of the club, you're also permitted to wear our kit when you're out cycling. It's green and white. Yes, I've seen cyclists wearing it. So can I buy that at the club? 
Uh, no, it's made to order by a company in Brisbane. You can find them online. They're called Jerry's. That's J E R R I Z. You can use your membership number to put in an order on their website. Okay. Now, can you tell me a bit about the rides I can do? Sure. So we have training rides pretty well every morning, and they're a really good way of improving your cycling skills as well as your general level of fitness. But they're different levels. Level A is pretty fast. You're looking at about thirty or thirty-five kilometers an hour. If you can do about twenty-five kilometers an hour, you'd probably be level B. And then level C are the novices who stay at about fifteen kilometers per hour. Right. Well, I reckon I'd be level B. So when are the sessions for that level? Ah,、uh, there are a couple each week. They're both early morning sessions. There's one on Tuesdays, and for that one, you meet at five thirty a.m. And the meeting points the stadium. Do you know where that is? Yes, it's quite near my home. In fact, okay. And how about the other one? That's on Thursdays. It starts at the same time, but they meet at the main gate to the park. Is that the one just past the shopping mall? That's it. So, how long are the rides?、Uh, they're about an hour and a half. So, if you have a job, it's easy to fit in before you go to work. And the members often go somewhere for coffee afterwards, so it's quite a social event. Okay, that sounds good. I've only just moved to the city, so I don't actually know many people yet. Well, it's a great way to meet people. And does each ride have a leader? Sometimes, but not always. But you don't really need one. The group members on the ride support one another anyway. How would we know where to go? If you check the club website, you'll see that the route for each ride is clearly marked, so you can just print that out and take it along with you. It's similar from one week to another, but it's not always exactly the same. And what do I need to bring? Hmm. Well, bring a bottle of water and your phone. You shouldn't use it while you're cycling, but have it with you. Right. And in winter, it's well before sunrise when we set out, so you need to make sure your bike's got lights. That's okay. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd definitely like to join. So, what's the best way of going about it? Ah,、uh, you can. Section two. Thanks for coming, everyone. Okay, so this meeting is for new staff and staff who haven't been involved with our volunteering projects yet. So basically, the idea is that we allow staff to give up some of their work time to help on various charity projects to benefit the local community. We've been doing this for the last five years, and it's been very successful. Participating doesn't necessarily involve a huge time commitment. The company will pay for eight hours of your time, that can be used over one or two days all at once, or spread over several months throughout the year. There are some staff who enjoy volunteering so much they also give up their own free time for a couple of hours every week. It's completely up to you. Obviously, many people will have family commitments and aren't as available as other members of staff. Feedback from staff has been overwhelmingly positive, because they felt they were doing something really useful. Nearly everyone agreed that volunteering made them feel more motivated at work. They also liked building relationships with the people in the local community, and felt valued by them. One or two people also said it was a good thing to have on their CVs. One particularly successful project last year. Was the Get Working project? This was aimed at helping unemployed people in the area get back to work. Our staff were able to help them improve their telephone skills, such as writing down messages and speaking with confidence to potential customers, which they had found quite difficult. 
This is something many employers look for in job applicants, and something we all do without even thinking about every day at work. We've got an exciting new project starting this year. Up until now, we've mainly focused on projects to do with education and training, and we'll continue with our reading project in schools and our work with local charities. But we've also agreed to help out on a conservation project in Redfern Park. So if any of you fancy being outside and getting your hands dirty, this is the project for you. I also wanted to mention the annual Digital Inclusion Day, which is coming up next month. The aim of this is to help older people keep up with technology. And this year, instead of hosting the event in our own training facility, we're using the ICT suite at Hill College, as it can hold far more people. We've invited over 60 people from the Silver Age Community Center to take part, so we'll need a lot of volunteers to help with this event. If you're interested in taking part, please go to the volunteering section of our website and complete the relevant form. We won't be providing any training for this, but you'll be paired with an experienced volunteer if you've never done it before. By the way, don't forget to tell your manager about any volunteering activities you decide to do. The participants on the Digital Inclusion Day really benefited. The majority were in their 70s, though some were younger, and a few were even in their 90s. Quite a few owned both a computer and a mobile phone, but these tended to be outdated models. They generally knew how to do simple things like send texts, but weren't aware of recent developments in mobile phone technology. A few were keen to learn, but most were quite dismissive at first. They couldn't see the point of updating their skills. But that soon changed. The feedback was very positive. The really encouraging thing was that participants all said they felt much more confident about using social media to keep in touch with their grandchildren, who prefer this form of communication to phoning or sending emails. A lot of them also said playing online games would help them make new friends and keep their brains active. They weren't that impressed with being able to order their groceries online, as they liked going out to the shops, but some said it would come in handy if they were ill or the weather was really bad. One thing they asked about was using tablets for things like reading newspapers. Some people had been given tablets as presents, but had never used them. So that's something we'll make sure we include this time. Section 3 uh, come in, Russ. Thank you. Now, you wanted to consult me about your class presentation on nanotechnology. You're due to give it next week, aren't you? That's right, and I'm really struggling. I chose the topic because I didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more, but now I've read so much about it, in a way there's too much to say. I could talk for much longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated. Should I assume the other students don't know much and give them a kind of general introduction? Or should I try and make them share my fascination with a particular aspect? You could do either, but you'll need to have it clear in your own mind. Then I think I'll give an overview. OK. Now, one way of approaching this is to work through developments in chronological order. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you could talk about the numerous ways that nanotechnology is being applied. You mean things like thin films on camera displays to make them water repellent and additives to make motorcycle helmets stronger and lighter? Exactly. Or another way would be to focus on its impact in one particular area, say medicine or space exploration. That would make it easier to focus. Perhaps I should do that. I think that would be a good idea. Right. How important is it to include slides in the presentation? They aren't essential by any means. And there's a danger of tailoring what you say to fit whatever slides you can find. While it can be good to include slides, you could end up spending too long looking for suitable ones. You might find it better to leave them out. I see. Another thing I was wondering about was how to start. I know presentations often begin with 
First, I'm going to talk about this, and then I'll talk about that. But I thought about asking the audience what they know about nanotechnology. That would be fine if you had an hour or two for the presentation, but you might find that you can't do anything with the answers you get, and it simply eats into the short time that's available. So maybe I should mention a particular way that nanotechnology is used to focus people's attention. That sounds sensible. What do you think I should do next? I really have to plan the presentation today and tomorrow. Well, initially, I think you should ignore all the notes you've made, take a small piece of paper, and write a single short sentence that ties together the whole presentation. It can be something as simple as. Nanotechnology is already improving our lives. Then start planning the content around that. You can always modify that sentence later if you need to. Okay. Before you hear the. Okay. Now let's think about actually giving the presentation. You've only given one before, if I remember correctly, about an experiment you'd been involved in. That's right. It was pretty rubbish. Let's say it was better in some respects than in others. With regard to the structure, I felt that you ended rather abruptly without rounding it off. Be careful not to do that in next week's presentation. Okay. And you made very little eye contact with the audience because you were looking down at your notes most of the time. You need to be looking at the audience and only occasionally glancing at your notes.、Hmm. Your body language was a little odd. Every time you showed a slide, you turned your back on the audience so you could look at it. You should have been looking at your laptop, and you kept scratching your head. So I found myself wondering when you were next going to do that instead of listening to what you were saying. Oh dear! What did you think of the language? I knew that not everyone was familiar with the subject, so I tried to make it as simple as I could. Yes, that came across. You used a few words that are specific to the field, but you always explained what they meant, so the audience wouldn't have had any difficulty understanding. Uh huh. I must say the handouts you prepared were well thought out. They were a good summary of your presentation, which people would have been able to refer to later on. So well done on that. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps you with next week's presentation. Yes, it will. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to seeing a big improvement then. Section one. Hello, Linda speaking. Oh, hi, Linda. This is Matt Brooks. Alex White gave me your number. He said you'd be able to give me some advice about moving to Banford. Yes, Alex did mention you. How can I help? Well, first of all. Which area to live in? Well, I live in Dalton, which is a really nice suburb, not too expensive, and there's a nice park. Sounds good. Do you know how much it would be to rent a two-bedroom flat there? Yeah, you should be able to get something reasonable for eight hundred and fifty pounds per month. That's what people typically pay. You certainly wouldn't want to pay more than nine hundred pounds. That doesn't include bills or anything. No, that sounds all right. I'll definitely have a look there. Are the transport links easy from where you live? Well, I'm very lucky. I work in the city centre, so I don't have to use public transport. I go by bike. Oh, I wish I could do that. Is it safe to cycle around the city? Yes, it's fine, and it keeps me fit. Anyway, driving to work in the city centre would be a nightmare because there's hardly any parking, and the traffic during the rush hour can be bad. I'd be working from home. But I'd have to go to London one or two days a week. Oh, that's perfect. Getting to London is no problem. There's a fast train every thirty minutes, which only takes forty-five minutes. That's good. Yeah, 
The train service isn't bad during the week, and they run quite late at night. It's weekends that are a problem. They're always doing engineering work, and you have to take a bus to Haddam and pick up the train there, which is really slow. But other than that, Banford's a great place to live. I've never been happier. There are some nice restaurants in the city centre and a brand new cinema, which has only been open a couple of months. There's a good art centre too. Sounds like Banford's got it all. Yes, we're really lucky. There are lots of really good aspects to living here. The schools are good, and the hospital here is one of the best in the country. Everyone I know who's been there's had a positive experience. Oh, I can give you the name of my dentist too, in Bridge Street, if you're interested. I've been going to him for years, and I've never had any problems. Oh, OK, thanks. I'll find his number and send it to you. Thanks. That would be really helpful. Are you planning to visit Banford soon? Yes. My wife and I are both coming next week. We want to make some appointments with estate agents. I could meet you if you like and show you around. Are you sure? We'd really appreciate that. Either Tuesday or Thursday is good for me, after 5.30. Thursday's preferable. Tuesday, I need to get home before 6 p.m. OK. Great. Let me know which train you're catching and I'll meet you in the cafe outside. You can't miss it. It's opposite the station and next to the museum. Brilliant. I'll text you next week then. Thanks so much for all the advice. No problem. I'll see you next week. Section 2 So, if you're one of those people who hasn't found the perfect physical activity yet, here are some things to think about which might help you make the right decision for you. The first question to ask yourself is whether you would enjoy training in a gym. Many people are put off by the idea of having to fit a visit to the gym into their busy day. You often have to go very early or late, as some gyms can get very crowded. But with regular training, you'll see a big difference in a relatively short space of time. Running has become incredibly popular in recent years. That's probably got a lot to do with the fact that it's a very accessible form of exercise. Anyone can run, even if you can only run a few metres to begin with. But make sure you get the right shoes. It's worth investing in a high-quality pair, and they don't come cheap. Another great thing about running is that you can do it at any time of day or night. The only thing that may stop you is snow and ice. Swimming is another really good way to build fitness. What attracts many people is that you can swim in an indoor pool at any time of year. On the other hand, it can be quite boring or solitary. It's hard to chat to people while you're swimming lengths. Cycling has become almost as popular as running in recent years. That's probably because, as well as improving their fitness, many people say being out in the fresh air in a park or in the countryside can be fun. Provided the conditions are right, of course. Only fanatics go out in the wind and rain. Yoga is a good choice for those of you looking for exercise which focuses on developing both a healthy mind and body. It's a good way of building strength, and with the right instructor, there's less chance of hurting yourself than with other more active sports. But don't expect to find it easy. It can be surprisingly challenging, especially for people who aren't very flexible. 
Getting a personal trainer is a good way to start your fitness program. Obviously, there can be significant costs involved, but if you've got someone there to encourage you and help you achieve your goals, you're less likely to give up. Make sure you get someone with a recognised qualification, though, or you could do yourself permanent damage. Whatever you do, don't join a gym unless you're sure you'll make good use of it. So many people waste lots of money by signing up for membership and then hardly ever go. What happens to their good intentions? I don't think people suddenly stop caring about improving their fitness or decide they have more important things to do. I think people lose interest when they don't think they're making enough progress. That's when they give up hope and stop believing they'll ever achieve their goals. Also, what people sometimes don't realise when they start is that it takes a lot of determination and hard work to keep training week after week, and lots of people don't have that kind of commitment. One thing you can do to help yourself is to set manageable goals. Be realistic and don't push yourself too far. Some people advise writing goals down, but I think it's better to have a flexible approach. Give yourself a really nice treat every time you reach one of your goals, and don't get too upset if you experience setbacks. It's a journey. There are bound to be difficulties along the way. Section 3 OK, Jim. You wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not, but for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK, so in your project, you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish. And it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. 
It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. A lot of work. Section 4 Last week we started looking at reptiles, including crocodiles and snakes. Today, I'd like us to have a look at another reptile, the lizard, and in particular, at some studies that have been done on a particular type of lizard whose Latin name is Teliqua rugosa. This is commonly known as the sleepy lizard because it's quite slow in its movements and spends quite a lot of its time dozing under rocks or lying in the sun. I'll start with a general description. Sleepy lizards live in Western and South Australia, where they're quite common. Unlike European lizards, which are mostly small, green and fast-moving, sleepy lizards are brown, but what's particularly distinctive about them is the colour of their tongue, which is dark blue, in contrast with the lining of their mouth, which is bright pink. And they're much bigger than most European lizards. They have quite a varied diet, including insects and even small animals, but they mostly eat plants of varying kinds. Even though they're quite large and powerful, with strong jaws that can crush beetles and snail shells, they still have quite a few predators. Large birds like cassowaries were one of the main ones in the past, but nowadays they're more likely to be caught and killed by snakes. Actually, another threat to their survival isn't a predator at all, but is man-made. Quite a large number of sleepy lizards are killed by cars when they're trying to cross highways. One study carried out by Michael Freak at Flinders University investigated the methods of navigation of these lizards. Though they move slowly, they can travel quite long distances. And he found that even if they were taken some distance away from their home territory, they could usually find their way back home as long as they could see the sky. They didn't need any other landmarks on the ground. Observations of these lizards in the wild have also revealed that their mating habits are quite unusual. Unlike most animals, it seems that they're relatively monogamous, returning to the same partner year after year. And the male and female also stay together for a long time, both before and after the birth of their young. It's quite interesting to think about the possible reasons for this. It could be that it's to do with protecting their young. You'd expect them to have a much better chance of survival if they have both parents around. But in fact, observers have noted that once the babies have hatched out of their eggs, they have hardly any contact with their parents. So there's not really any evidence to support that idea. Another suggestion is based on the observation that male lizards in monogamous relationships tend to be bigger and stronger than other males. So maybe the male lizards stay around so they can give the female lizards protection from other males. But again, we're not really sure. Finally, I'd like to mention another study that involved collecting data by tracking the lizards. I was actually involved in this myself. So we caught some lizards in the wild and we developed a tiny GPS system that would allow us to track them and we fix this onto their tails. Then we set the lizards free again, and we were able to track them for 12 days and gather data, not just about their location, but even about how many steps they took during this period. One surprising thing we discovered from this is that there were far fewer meetings between lizards than we expected. It seems that they were actually trying to avoid one another. 
So why would that be? Well, again, we have no clear evidence, but one hypothesis is that male lizards can cause quite serious injuries to one another. So maybe this avoidance is a way of preventing this, of self-preservation, if you like. But we need to collect a lot more data before we can be sure of any of this. Section 1 Hi, Alex. It's Martha Klein's here. James White gave me your number. I hope you don't mind me calling you. Of course not. How are you, Martha? Good, thanks. I'm ringing because I need a bit of advice. Oh, yeah. What about? The training you did at JPNW a few years ago. I'm applying for the same thing. Oh, right. Yes, I did mine in 2014. Best thing I ever did. I'm still working there. Really? What are you doing? Well, now I work in the customer services department, but I did my initial training in finance. I stayed there for the first two years and then moved to where I am now. That's the same department I'm applying for. Did you enjoy it? Uh, I was pretty nervous to begin with. I didn't do well in my exams at school and I was really worried because I failed maths. But it didn't actually matter because I did lots of courses on the job. Did you get a diploma at the end of your trainee period? I'm hoping to do the one in business skills. Yes, that sounds good. I took the one on IT skills, but I wish I'd done that one instead. OK, that's good to know. Um, what about the other trainees? How did you get on with them? There were about 20 of us who started at the same time, and we were all around the same age. I was 18, and there was only one person younger than me who was 17. The rest were between 18 and 20. I made some good friends. I've heard lots of good things about the training at JPNW. It seems like there are a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, definitely. Because of its size, you can work in loads of different areas within the organisation. What about pay? I know you get a lower minimum wage than regular employees. That's right, which isn't great. But you get the same number of days holiday as everyone else, and the pay goes up massively if they offer you a job at the end of the training period. Yeah, but I'm not doing it for the money. It's the experience I think will be really useful. Everyone says by the end of the year you gain so much confidence. You're right, that's the most useful part about it. There's a lot of variety too. You're given lots of different things to do. I enjoyed it all. I didn't even mind the studying. Do you have to spend any time in college? Yes, one day each month. So you get lots of support from both your tutor and your manager. Hmm, that's good. And the company is easy to get to, isn't it? Yes, it's very close to the train station, so the location's a real advantage. Have you got a date for your interview yet? Yes, it's on the 23rd of this month. So long as you're well prepared, there's nothing to worry about. Everyone's very friendly. I am not sure what I should wear. What do you think? Nothing too casual, like jeans, for example. If you've got a nice jacket, wear that with a skirt or trousers. OK, thanks. Any other tips? Um, well, I know it's really obvious, but arrive in plenty of time. They hate people who are late. So make sure you know exactly where you have to get to. And one other useful piece of advice my manager told me before I had the interview for this job is to smile. Even if you feel terrified, it makes people respond better to you. <laughs> I'll have to practice doing that in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck. Let me know if you need any more information. Thanks very much. Section 2 Hi everyone, welcome to the Snow Centre. My name's Annie. I hope you enjoyed the bus trip from the airport. We've certainly got plenty of snow today. Well, you've come to New Zealand's premier snow and ski centre and we've a whole load of activities for you during your week here. Most visitors come here for the cross-country skiing where you're on fairly flat ground for most of the time rather than going down steep mountainsides. There are marked trails, but you can also leave these and go off on your own, and that's an experience not to be missed. You can go at your own speed. It's great aerobic exercise if you really push yourself, 
Or, if you prefer, you can just glide gently along and enjoy the beautiful scenery. This afternoon, you'll be going on a dog sled trip. You may have seen our dogs on TV recently racing in the Winter Sled Festival. If you want, you can have your own team for the afternoon and learn how to drive them, following behind our leader on the trail. Or if you'd prefer, you can just sit back in the sled and enjoy the ride as a passenger. At the weekend, we have the team relay event and you're all welcome to join in. We have a local school coming along and a lot of the teachers are taking part too. Participation rather than winning is the main focus and there's a medal for everyone who takes part. Participants are in teams of two to four and each team must complete four laps of the course. For your final expedition, you'll head off to Mount Frenna wearing a pair of special snowshoes which allow you to walk on top of the snow. This is an area where miners once searched for gold, though there are very few traces of their work left now. When the snow melts in summer, the mountain slopes are carpeted in flowers and plants. It's a long ascent, though not too steep, and walkers generally take a couple of days to get to the summit and return. You'll spend the night in our hut halfway up the mountain. That's included in your package for the stay. It's got cooking facilities, firewood and water for drinking. For washing, we recommend you use melted snow, though, to conserve supplies. We can take your luggage up on our snowmobile for you for just $10 a person. The hut has cooking facilities, so you can make a hot meal in the evening and morning, but you need to take your own food. The weather on Mount Frenna can be very stormy. In that case, stay in the hut. Generally, the storms don't last long. Don't stress about getting back here to the centre in time to catch the airport bus. They'll probably not be running anyway. We do have an emergency locator beacon in the hut, but only use that if it's a real emergency, like if someone's ill or injured. Now, let me tell you something about the different ski trails you can follow during your stay here. Highland Trail's directly accessible from where we are now, this trail's been designed to give first-timers an experience they'll enjoy regardless of their age or skill, but it's also ideal for experts to practice their technique. Then there's Pine Trail. If you're nervous about skiing, leave this one to the experts. You follow a steep valley looking right down on the river below. Scary! But if you've fully mastered the techniques needed for hills, it's great fun. Stony Trail's a good choice once you've got a general idea of the basics. There are one or two tricky sections, but nothing too challenging. There's a shelter halfway where you can sit and take a break and enjoy the afternoon sunshine. And finally, Loser's Trail. This starts off following a gentle river valley, but the last part is quite exposed, so the snow conditions can be challenging. If it's snowing or windy, Check with us before you set out to make sure the trail's open that day. Right, so now if you'd like to follow me, we'll get started. Section 3 I still got loads to do for our report on nutritional food labels. Me too. What did you learn from doing the project about your own shopping habits? Well... I've always had to check labels for traces of peanuts in everything I eat because of my allergy. But beyond that, I've never really been concerned enough to check how healthy a product is. This project has actually taught me to read the labels much more carefully. I tended to believe claims on packaging, like low in fat. But I now realise that the healthy yoghurt I've bought for years is full of sugar and that it's actually quite high in calories. Mm. Ready meals are the worst. Comparing the labels on supermarket pizzas was a real eye-opener. Did you have any idea how many calories they contain? I was amazed. Yes, because unless you read the label really carefully, you wouldn't know that the nutritional values given are for half a pizza. When most people eat the whole pizza. Not exactly transparent, is it? Not at all. But I expect it won't stop you from buying pizza. Probably not, no. 
I thought comparing the different labelling systems used by food manufacturers was interesting. I think the kind of labelling system used makes a big difference. Which one did you prefer? I liked the traditional daily value system best, the one which tells you what proportion of your required daily intake of each ingredient the product contains. I'm not sure it's the easiest for people to use, but at least you get the full story. I like to know all the ingredients in a product, not just how much fat, salt and sugar they contain. But it's good supermarkets have been making an effort to provide reliable information for customers. Yes. There just needs to be more consistency between labelling systems used by different supermarkets in terms of portion sizes, etc. Hmm. The labels on the different brands of chicken flavour crisps were quite revealing too, weren't they? Yeah. I don't understand how they can get away with calling them chicken flavour when they only contain artificial additives. I know. I'd at least have expected them to contain a small percentage of real chicken. Absolutely. I think having nutritional food labelling has been a good idea, don't you? I think it will change people's behaviour and stop mothers, in particular, buying the wrong things. But didn't that study kind of prove the opposite? People didn't necessarily stop buying unhealthy products. They only said that might be the case. Those findings weren't that conclusive, and it was quite a small-scale study. I think more research has to be done. Yes, I think you're probably right. What do you think of the traffic light system? I think supermarkets like the idea of having a colour-coded system, red, orange or green, for levels of fat, sugar and salt in a product. But it's not been adopted universally, and not on all products. Why do you suppose that is? Pressure from the food manufacturers. Hardly surprising that some of them are opposed to flagging up how unhealthy their products are. I'd have thought it would have been compulsory. It seems ridiculous it isn't. I know. And what I couldn't get over is the fact that it was brought in without enough consultation. A lot of experts had deep reservations about it. That is a bit weird. I suppose there's an argument for doing the research now when consumers are familiar with this system. Yeah, maybe. The participants in the survey were quite positive about the traffic light system. Hmm. But I don't think they targeted the right people. They should have focused on people with low literacy levels, because these labels are designed to be accessible to them. Yeah. But it's good to get feedback from all socio-economic groups, and there wasn't much variation in their responses. No. But if they hadn't interviewed participants face-to-face, -face, they could have used a much bigger sample size. I wonder why they chose that method. Don't know. How were they selected? Did they volunteer or were they approached? I think they volunteered. The thing that wasn't stated was how often they bought packaged food. All we know is how frequently they use the supermarket. Section 4 In my presentation, I'm going to talk about coffee and its importance both in economic and social terms. We think it was first drunk in the Arab world, but there's hardly any documentary evidence of it before the 1500s. Although, of course, that doesn't mean that people didn't know about it before then. However, there is evidence that coffee was originally gathered from bushes growing wild in Ethiopia, in the northeast of Africa. In the early 16th century, it was being bought by traders and gradually its use as a drink spread throughout the Middle East. It's also known that in 1522, in the Turkish city of Constantinople, which was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, the court physician approved its use as a medicine. By the mid-1500s, coffee bushes were being cultivated in the Yemen, and for the next hundred years, this region produced most of the coffee drunk in Africa and the Arab world. What's particularly interesting about coffee is its effect on social life. 
It was rarely drunk at home, but instead people went to coffee houses to drink it. These people, usually men, would meet to drink coffee and chat about issues of the day. But at the time, this chance to share ideas and opinions was seen as something that was potentially dangerous. And in 1623, the ruler of Constantinople demanded the destruction of all the coffee houses in the city, although after his death, many new ones opened and coffee consumption continued. In the 17th century, coffee drinking spread to Europe, and here too, coffee shops became places where ordinary people, nearly always men, could meet to exchange ideas. Because of this, some people said that these places performed a similar function to universities. The opportunity they provided for people to meet together outside their own homes and to discuss the topics of the day had an enormous impact on social life, and many social movements and political developments had their origins in coffee house discussions. In the late 1600s, the Yemeni monopoly on coffee production broke down, and coffee production started to spread around the world, helped by European colonisation. Europeans set up coffee plantations in Indonesia and the Caribbean, and production of coffee in the colonies skyrocketed. Different types of coffee were produced in different areas, and it's interesting that the names given to these different types like mocha or java coffee, were often taken from the port they were shipped to Europe from. But if you look at the labour system in the different colonies, there were some significant differences. In Brazil and the various Caribbean colonies, coffee was grown in huge plantations, and the workers there were almost all slaves. But this wasn't the same in all colonies. For example, in Java, which had been colonised by the Dutch, the peasants grew coffee and passed a proportion of this on to the Dutch, so it was used as a means of taxation. But whatever system was used, under the European powers of the 18th century, coffee production was very closely linked to colonisation. Coffee was grown in ever-increasing quantities to satisfy the growing demand from Europe and it became nearly as important as sugar production, which was grown under very similar conditions. However, coffee prices were not yet low enough for people to drink it regularly at home, so most coffee consumption still took place in public coffee houses, and it still remained something of a luxury item. In Britain, however, a new drink was introduced from China and started to become popular, gradually taking over from coffee, although at first it was so expensive that only the upper classes could afford it. This was tea, and by the late 1700s it was being widely drunk. However, when the USA gained independence from Britain in 1776, they identified this drink with Britain, and coffee remained the preferred drink in the USA, as it still is today. So, by the early 19th century, Coffee was already being widely produced and consumed. But during this century, production boomed and coffee prices started to fall. This was partly because new types of transportation had been developed, which were cheaper and more efficient. So now, working people could afford to buy coffee. It wasn't just a drink for the middle classes. And this was at a time when large parts of Europe were starting to work in industries and sometimes this meant their work didn't stop when it got dark. They might have to continue throughout the night. So the use of coffee as a stimulant became important. It wasn't just a drink people drank in the morning for breakfast. There were also changes in cultivation.